Hey there, uh, I wanted to uh, do a little introduction to this conversation that I had with some people on my Patreon. Uh, it's a conversation based on the movie Riders of Justice, which came out in 2020 and stars uh, Mads Mikkelsen. Uh, hopefully I'm saying his name right. Uh, really great movie, uh, one of my favourite movies that has come out in recent years. Uh, I wanted just to introduce it uh, because I wanted to say don't listen to this if you want to avoid spoilers because we're going to talk about the film, dissect it. Um, and I really do recommend if you're going to watch it, watch it before you look at this. So that's the main reason why I'm talking to you right now. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to share this because I thought it was a particularly interesting conversation. Uh, people. Uh, brought out some really, really interesting things about the movie um, because I think the movie is so good. Uh, so what else do I need to say? Oh yeah, well, if you're enjoying this conversation, uh, we do this every month on my Patreon. It's open to everybody. Uh, we pick a movie, uh, we watch it at some stage during the month, and then we get together and discuss it. Uh, and this is one that I was leading, and the movie was one I chose. The next one we're doing, I think, might be Fight Club. So if you're interested in this, it's called Exposure. It's one of the many things that happens on my Patreon. Uh, but apart from that, go and watch the movie and then listen to the conversation. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Bye. Okay, hello everyone. I'm very excited about this um, because I get to share with you uh, a film that I really enjoyed. Now, I'd be interested to find out whether you liked it or didn't like it and all of that. But, um, you know, one is I personally just enjoyed it. I like that guy, Mads Mikkelsen, as an actor. There's a lot of movies he's been in. He's got a very distinctive look and vibe, and I like. Uh, but this film came out of nowhere. I I have not been that impressed by what's been coming out of in the cinema in the last, like, few years, I have to say. So this one caught me completely by surprise. Uh, I don't even know if anyone told me about it. I think I just found it on on iTunes two years ago. I like Mad, Mads Mikkelsen. And when I put it on, I have to confess that when I realized it was Danish, I was like, I was, I would have been tempted to turn it off, go like, am I going to watch something with subtitles? But I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And was really drawn into it. So I'm guessing most of you have watched it. Uh, uh, so spoilers are plenty. Um, you know, and I won't be able to say any of the actors' names, either the real names or the actors' names, not even going to bother. I'm, I'm just going to talk about the themes. But as you know, basically the story is set up that this wife of this man who's a soldier, she dies in this train accident. And it's all about, you know, finding whether someone's responsible, who's responsible. And just my little intro to the film would be to say that, you know, it's all about, um, it's all about contingency. It's all about um, mourning. It's all about the need sometimes to have someone to blame, uh, having a fetish object um, that prevents you from encountering your own suffering. Um, so like a fetish object would be, Whenever I had, I had a friend who died, like this is a long time ago, 30 years ago now, um, but he died tragically uh, in a climbing accident and his parents were obviously distraught, devastated. And for many years, they didn't take his room apart. They kept his room exactly as it was. And his father was a very stoic man and didn't show any emotion. Uh, he was a very, very quiet man and it, it absolutely devastated him, but he was, he didn't show anything. And years later, when they took the room apart, that was one of the, the times when he just broke down. So he mourned, I'm sure, a number of times, but the taking down of the room was this, was this event. Um, and so in a way, keeping the room as it was, was somehow holding something together. Sometimes it might be a pet Maybe you break up with somebody and you don't necessarily feel it, but then the pet that you both own dies and for no inexplicable, inexplicable reason, you're just in tears. Somehow that object was somehow preventing you from mourning and in a good way, like in some of times you, 
it's too painful. Too, something's too painful for you to be able to even let yourself cry about. And an object, a fetish object is an object. It's not magical, but you treat it as if it is it's an object. And um, so I want to come back to that idea in a second. But um, there's a beautiful scene early on in the church where the minister gives quite a bizarre, you hear a snippet of the sermon. And she says, basically, you know, like whenever something good happens, we may see a miracle. And then she says, when something bad happens, sometimes it just feels contingent. But if there's not a reason, you know, what do you do with your suffering? I think it's basically that. And it's a question. It's great. It kind of ends with a question. You know, if if there's not a reason, um, then what what do you do? And at first, there's a sense in which, of course, you're going like, okay, that's the church thing. This The sacred world wants to offer you a reason for the death. But the whole brilliant thing about the movie is it's kind of showing about how it doesn't it's it, there's a religious dimension to the secular world. Like all of these people in this movie, all the main protagonists are all wanting a reason. They all need a reason um, to explain uh, whether it's because of guilt, whether it's because of mourning, um, whether it's because of loneliness they're all drawn into the desire and the need to have some reason. And that reason kind of protects them from, from the suffering, from the pain. And so there's a real interesting kind of sets up the religious church is the place where the question is asked, what do you do? And then I think the whole movie is a really beautiful exploration of, yes, what do you do? Um, and one of the key moments for me is whenever Mads Mikkelsen, he um, uh, realizes that there was a mistaken identity. The person they thought was the brother of the president of Riders of Justice was on the train, was something to do with this. And then they find out he wasn't there at all. And someone else completely random was there. And there's a moment where he just can't cope and he has a, a breakdown and he goes into the bathroom and he destroys everything and all the emotion comes because in a way that was a fetish object like he had someone to blame he had a reason he had a scapegoat he had that and that kept him together but when he was kind of confronted with this radical contingency that just this is kind of a, a, a ve an unfortunate horrible event that came together because of a whole range, an almost infinite range. Uh, one of the guys says, uh, uh, what was the number? It was a centillion or whatever number of reasons that come together to, to make this disaster occur. Um, when he realizes that, he then breaks down. Um, and then the movie... I found it very emotional. I watched it today again, second time I watched that. And I actually watched it with a friend whose wife uh, just died uh, six months ago. And I never thought when I put it on, I said, oh, I have to watch this movie. You know, I'm talking about this movie. Do you want to watch it with me? And we sat down to watch it. And then he was like, he made a joke about it, but he said, oh, Pete, you picked a movie about a man who loses his wife. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, no. Um, uh, so I think it was very emotional for him, you know, as well, and watching it with him. I mean, not he he lost her to illness, um, but uh, but that kind of added another, obviously, another dimension to it. But we watched it today, and what I think, how I take the ending, and there's a lot in it, but how I take the ending is they they answer the question that was raised by the minister in the church. You know, what do you do with your suffering? What do you do if there isn't some answer? And it's kind of like community. It's friendship. It's, it's kind of like mourning together, speaking together, because he cannot speak as suffering. He refuses to talk to a professional. He refuses to talk to anybody. Um, and I love it because it's not that he, it's not that at the end he's sitting in a therapy room, right? It's not like anything like that, which would be really cheesy. Um, He's still a grumpy guy, but with his Christmas jumper on. And um, 
there's he still thinks his friends are assholes. You know, there's that look in his face when the guy's trying to play his French horn, and there's a sense in which there's still tension in the group, but also beautiful, beautiful friendship, community, um, people who have gone through something together, having to come to terms with the loss without having some 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 overarching meaning for it okay so those are my thoughts i'm gonna change the there we go um anybody want to jump in with your thoughts about the movie um and what you took out of it or any scenes that particularly interested you or whether you took something different out i mean who agrees with me or kind of saw something completely different in the movie that's that's possible I I agree with everything you said, but there's one scene I really wanted to highlight that you didn't oh, yes. mention. Yeah. And that was honestly, okay, I wish I could remember this actor's name, but the guy with like the longer hair who does like the weird therapy intervention. <laughs> yeah. He was so good. Every, even like, I swear to God, the scene where he like bears his asshole to the world. I was like, this, what? What is that? Is this like the most genius therapy I've ever seen in my life? Or is this guy a total psycho? One of those things are true. Maybe both of those things are true, but mm. he was so good. And he had several, like his character had several moments throughout the film where he did his own little crazy interventions like that. Like even during the little awkward like Christmas party where he's the one who like forces himself to have a little angry outburst just to like break the tension and try to like get people to settle down. And I was like, oh my gosh, this man is like a little genius. And I want to go back and just like focus on his character more through the film because he was so fun to watch. Yes, no, he's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I'll speak. I think um, you touched on uh, kind of the empathy and the emotion, the family, kind of this, <clears throat> I don't know, this misfit group of people that wind up together and how uh, how that might relate to communities of pyrotheology of um, that I think his name is uh, uh, Marcus Mads who's uh, um, Marcus that's right yeah, yeah. Struggling, struggling through this right but there's a moment there where they're in the kitchen and I think it's the boyfriend of the daughter Matilda who's how uh, <clears throat> they're they're all jabbering at each other and he says ah I know what this is it says it's BMT right there's some sort of like uh, behavioral therapy <laughs> this is what they're doing and it's leonard is the, the wild guy's name and he says um he says he goes yes that's exactly what it is and she says what's bmt and he goes ah oh, we're busy right now we'll get to that later because he has no idea what it is so um and then they just a few minutes later they're in the car it's the the um it's mads and otto and leonard and Leonard's driving Mads crazy, talking, confronting him about um, his relationship, maybe with his daughter, or like how he's handling everything with violence. And he says, uh, and he, he starts to reach back to him with violence, right? It was just exactly his default. You know, his scapegoat is find somebody, and I'm going to deal with this with through violence. And he says, um, Leonard says, hey, um, he goes, you, you can't agree to do this therapy and then quit as soon as it starts to hurt. And so he's actually taken on the role of doing this therapy that the kid is bringing up. And then ultimately, when he winds up in the bathroom tearing it apart, it's Otto that's holding him, rubbing his back, holding his head in this most like most endearing, like loving moments I've ever seen in a film. And he did that. He rubbed the back of Emmon Tyler, the big guy, twice I saw him. He would he would go crazy and he'd start rubbing his back. And just that community of misfits. And it's like you don't have to be to fit in with them well. You just, it just there's the, the, the dynamic. He didn't have to go it alone. And somehow he was able to wind up through that, that sense yeah. of community. I don't know. That's what kind of what I took from the film. Like it is it, there was something so not cheesy about all of that. Like it was so um like they were giving therapy each other, to each other. They were caring right. for each other in the most awful kind of kind of silly. Like that, the whenever that beautiful conversation, beautiful conversation, but the you know the young guy who was the rent boy says like, you know, do you want to have anal sex with me? You know, so as you can sleep tonight. And he's like, no, it's all right. I'm I'm okay. 
And he goes, right. you know, thanks for saving my life. And thanks for not having anal sex with me. And he's like, <laughs> oh, that's okay, friend. That's okay, buddy. And it's like, you know, there's these beautiful, like, therapeutic moments. And they're so not, che- they're not like, they're so raw and <laughs> beautiful and funny and poignant. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Great movie. I enjoyed the heck out of it. the beginning. You think it's just going to be a, a revenge thriller, and then it just turns it on its head. And yeah. It's like, oh, wow. This is great. Oh, you brought something out there that I didn't realize. Like, I, that's my favorite time. Like, my other favorite movie of the last few years at the, came out at the same time and was Pig. And we did Pig and Exposure, I think. Oh, Pig. Um, I haven't seen that. I mean, I haven't oh. seen you talk about it, but I love the movie. Oh, it's so, so good. But it's the same, it's the same thing. I don't want to give too much away. I haven't seen it, but you think it's going to be a revenge movie and it's so much more. Um, and they both actually have a, quite a similar structure. Um, like as you said, you watch this, and at first it's like it's mad. It's like he's a he's a he's a he's a action character quite often, you know. So you're expecting it to be this raw, they're gonna get revenge, it's all of that. And yeah, and then it it kind of it starts with that scapegoat mechanism. It starts with that that what what Hollywood always movies give you, which is an enemy, and you vanquish the enemy, you get revenge on the enemy, and then you feel great at the end. Like basically, that's Hollywood movies. And Pig and Riders of Justice, they start with that. They hook you in. They hook your desire in, because to be honest with you, when I watched Pig, I love Nicolas Cage. Some of his movies and. I kind of was sitting down to watch a revenge film. I wanted Nicolas Cage to kick ass, right? Because there's something that really is appealing to something. But it, these movies hook you with that. And then they turn on his head. And again, in terms of power of theology, that's what I think the, the Christian liturgy is supposed to do. Is like, you think God is the answer to all your questions, is going to fix everything or whatever. And, and that's how you hook people in. Like, you, you allow people to think that. They sit down in the pew thinking that, and then you gradually disabuse them of that and show that in one sense, um, you know, sitting in the question is more important. So there's something structurally about the film where, again, it's hooked in because you're like, oh, like this cool guy is going to get revenge on these bad bikers. But it, it twists it and gives you something much more satisfying. Right. And through that relationship, he... It, uh, Matt, Matt Nicholson character says to Otto, um, he confronts him about him letting his daughter down, his daughter dying in a car accident through his drinking, right? And the tear that comes through his eye was unbelievable. I was like, oh my God, what a great actor. And he then he conveyed back to him his story. And only through people can we engage in that kind of lesson. Yeah. And what a response. Like you think he's going to, he should have shouted. Like you think like what a horrible thing for Marcus to say. And then he just says something beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Ruth, yeah. Well, Ruth, jump in there, see your hands up and then I'll go to Christian and then Courtney. Hey, Ruth. Yes. What I really um, liked was the young girls trying to figure out what happened and doing the di- diagram on the wall and her earnestness in repeating everything that happened and the philosophy behind um, the, the, the I, I don't like the violent parts of the movie. I, oh, yeah. I do not watch action films as a rule or I didn't even know about the genre of revenge films. Uh-huh. Um, that's interesting to know that that's a genre, but um, it's also very contemporary because of the dedication to the algorithm that the guys had. And and I'm a com- aspiring computer geek. I listen to all these tech shows and I hear about algorithms and, you know, now chat GBT and how we can tra- trace everything. Um, this this um, was very much in, the, in that... Um, real high tech thing and we're going to rely you know their reliance on um uh find you can find the answer to everything in the system if you just search hard enough and in the end when he came into the room and sat down with the girl and said that that wall that's nothing you know that's not going to prove anything and she finally just sighs and says yes I 
I realize that. Yeah, I that know. There... I love that. She kind of goes like, she kind of knows. She's like, yeah, she just needed someone to say it. Yeah, sorry, keep going. I love that scene. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was just, the, it was so meaningful. Where do you find meaning in life? Um, yeah. How do you find it? Can you trace everything that's happened and find meaning? Um, can you find it in the system? Where is meaning? Mm-hmm. Can you, find, like... if you have enough data points, can you know everything? Yes, and they, and that's even more, as you say, relevant now than two years ago with ChatGPT. But and right. you, like almost, you could say, I think, again, like coming to another moral of the film in a way, is that is it? It's kind of like they're all finding freedom from an answer. That's what that's what mm-hmm. she found freedom from in that moment. That's what he right. found freedom when he was saying it to her. You could see the lights going on in him, going, "Are we doing the same thing?" And right. That, so yeah, right. it's like freedom from this tyranny of trying to have the answer. Mm-hmm. Right. But there is um there is a free floating, not not having answers is another space. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. John Christian, do you want to jump in? I, well, so yeah. I'm a bit new to the pirate theology thing, but I have never looked at a film through the lens of pirate theology. But I was walking today, listening to one of your podcasts, Pete. I think it was The God Beyond God, um, maybe from November. But I was, as I'm listening to you talking, I'm thinking, well, I want to think about what I might say in this conversation. So I stopped and I took these notes. I said, at the most basic level, talking about the film, We want to give meaning to life and the things that happen to us, especially unexpected tragic events. So these guys become certain that the train event has meaning. And in a sense, they create a myth. So now they're caught up in the tyranny of certainty, which sadly produces death and destroys other lives as well. Only to discover in the end, much like I can't remember his name who entered the temple in bc that's right they they discover in the end much like i think pompeius discovered when the veil is torn there is nothing there to anchor me possibly what the parable was alluding to in the movie when the bear is ripped open there is no diamond ring so in the end the myth is broken and the protagonist experiences the nihilistic moment in the bathroom where you know he basically has to confront that there is nothing to support beautiful beautifully said and you 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 helped me like that was a great scene when he tells that parable and yes. it's hilarious whenever everyone's just like like he says something <laughs> so profound this guy he's just this kid he says and, no, and every, no one knows what to do with it but i didn't know what to do with it but i think actually you've just given me the answer like that is that's the story in a nutshell which is there there was no they're looking for the, you're thinking it's going to be the diamond ring there's going to be the yeah. answer they cut open and it's not there I mean, that's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Beautifully. Yeah. Said. And of course, it was it was very ritualistic, very specific. It was on the same time of year with the full moon. Da, 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 I'm going to follow this certain routine. I'm going to get this result. Only discover there's nothing there. Yeah. I wonder if you could uh, that like in one sense, do you wonder whether that that character is so interesting? He is so good because he's carried on throughout. He's this lovely guy who just cleans up and does things. But maybe he's the wise person in the midst who from the very beginning just kind of news like that story is kind of like right right the answer I think right there. that character is like the the Christ figure because he's like the bastard child that gets sacrificed from his parents from the very beginning and he just is like everyone's shit bag and then when he gets a chance to have one free decision he's just giving all the love and care he can to the people around him who need it yeah oh, very good yes yes <laughs> that's great um I'll share a couple ideas. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Please. So the first thing that spoke to me in the film was whenever they're in the church and the woman is giving, she's like the priest or the, the clergy, and she's giving this talk about, you know, where do we put our suffering? And it just made me reflect on my own theological upbringing and how, for some reason, when I saw good things happening in my life, family, friends, so forth, I would attribute that to God working in my life because I was um, sanctioned by God. I was serving the right God. I was doing the right things. But when I saw tragedy occur, I would say, well, 
God works in mysterious ways, or I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't place that blame in God necessarily. So I don't have much more to say about that, except I had an interesting, I felt this internal reflection from the way my faith was operating in my younger years. For whatever reason, if good things happened, God did that. Mm. If bad things happened, well, bad things just happened, right? Yeah. That's not God's responsibility. So I'm able to attribute the good things to God. But then why wouldn't I logically say, if God's in control, if this is all God's will, mm. maybe he's also responsible for the bad things that happen in our life. Which that I think the true. reason why I would not say that was because that would cause a rupture in my faith. Yeah. Now, Perhaps. interesting, that, that reminds me of something that Shizek said, where he said that some some religious people will, you know, attribute bad things that happen to them, you know, to God. And what he says is he says, sometimes people do that because he says, having an explanation, even if it's a bad one yeah. is better than having no explanation okay. at all, which okay. I was just, just whenever you're talking there, it's going like, Oh yeah, but it's interesting how as well. Sometimes we want any explanation rather right. than none. Um, okay. yeah, but because but you, you, ha you just didn't attribute it to God, but you still potentially wanted an explanation, I'm guessing just course, not yeah. sure. God. Um, because the more terrifying thing, uh, is, is potentially what the movie's about. The more terrifying thing being no explanation. There is no explanation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's not a treasure <clears throat> underneath the rock. You create yeah. a rock so heavy. You can't... <clears throat> yeah. And something, um, John, you said, which I kind of think was very key is it also helps me be very empathetic to the mythologies people create because you see why they did it. It protected them from suffering. Right. It protected them from anxiety, from mourning, from guilt. So one of them was guilty because his his daughter was killed, and was it his wife as well? His wife and daughter, just I, I can't remember, it's just his daughter. But what you know, there was guilt and guilt that he gave the seat up, and for the daughter and for Marcus, there was the the mourning, and so you kind of go, okay, you understand why people have these these stories, these mythologies, and so it's attacking them with rationality is not only ineffective but also sometimes unfair because you're yes. not you're not you're not empathetic to the fact that that person that might be holding them together and yeah, yeah. almost the movie very gradually says yeah you can let go of these but but you know be empathetic that someone believes something sometimes because because of there's pain and I, I always try to remember that when I'm talking to somebody and not try to argue somebody out of a ra like show how they're irrational going like no, Oh, can I give one example? Sorry, I don't want to dominate. And I'll Courtney jump over to you. Um, is uh, I've used this example before in the podcast, but a friend of mine, she um, she did this breath test for I can't remember what it was, but it was like some. So she was having like stomach issues, and so she sent this breath test to to test what enzymes were in her uh, intestine or something like that. But when she went to the royal meal. Uh, she had to sign a thing saying there's no biological materials. And she thought at the time, no biological materials, it's just my breath. So she signed that. And then she started to get terrified that she'd sent biological materials in the plane and, it, and the plane might blow up. Now, she's very, very intelligent, like in extreme intelligence. And so, of course, it's weird to go like, she thinks that her breath in an envelope might blow up the plane, right? I could rationally try to argue that that's not, rational right but it's not but that's not the point the point is that's a symptom and so as we talked and she knew it was a symptom but she still also couldn't help believing that the plane might blow up um but as we talked it was like she was angry at somebody who lived on a different continent uh but she was afraid of uh speaking her anger and her frustration because it might destroy the relationship and might break the bridge between the two people and so what was really going on is that symptom was actually saying that she wants to shout her breath. She wants to speak. She wants to say something, but there's a terror that it will destroy the relationship. And as we looked at what the symptom meant, it dissipated. So instead of rationally going, your breath won't blow up a plane. How could your breath blow up a plane? There's no scientific knowledge. That, no, there's no scientific way that could happen. That's the wrong approach. The, the right approach is going, what is this, what, what is this carrying? And uh, in the same way with those guys, like it was carrying something. That's um, good. 
Yeah. Do you mind if I finish? Oh, please. I had a yeah, couple more. Please. please. Oh, yeah. Sorry, take Courtney. your time. We've got plenty of time. Um, I won't be too much longer. Um, what I thought for me was kind of the crux of the film is, is the contrast between two scenes. So he's in the daughter's bedroom. She's the daughter. I think she comes to him and says, I'm having a hard time sleeping. He goes and sits by her, eventually sits um, on the bed with her. And he says, there's no such thing as angels. Your mother's dead. She's not coming back. You know, we don't need psychotherapy. We need to just move on, you know? So what instantly came to mind was a, a speech, a talk you gave when you told me about this talk with Lawrence Krauss. I immediately went and watched it, by the way. <laughs> I know. So I, shouldn't I, have actually, told you. I don't want I anybody actually, to ever watch that. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, I was actually very moved by your opening uh, talk, Peter. Oh, I thought okay. it was really beautiful. And I really loved what you had to say. And I did. It was frustrating to watch it, you know, in terms of how what you were saying wasn't getting across to people. I don't want to beat a dead horse. Yeah. You said something I'll probably never forget was that I'm not interested in what you believe. I'm interested in how you believe, you know. Yeah. And so the moment that they discover that, which, by the way, just in terms of like filmmaking, the structure of the film, I love the movie and the unexpected twist, the way they dropped it in there. I was just like, oh, my God. That's crazy, you know? And uh, so he's in the bathroom, he's losing his mind. And he says, he cries out, she's dead, she's dead. And so the whole time I'm wondering like in the psychoanalytic sense, he's professing what he believes. She is dead, she is not coming back. There's no sense mourning her, we must move on. But was he the whole time in a way, not fully believing that? Like why was it in that moment that he discovers this was in fact an accident? I no longer have this fetish object mm -hmm. to keep me connected to her, right? Now he's mourning. Now he understands yes. Yes. that she is dead. So I, I felt some sense of, of a connection there. And, um, and then the other thing is that ever since you introduced us to uh, Todd McGowan, I am in love with this idea of the gaze and fascinated by it. And I think it's a really beautiful, deep concept. And I want to know if I'm misinterpreting, but if I, I saw some essence of the gaze in there, whenever, um, I think the strongest evidence of the gaze is in the moment where he goes into the room and he's marveling at the beauty of her effort to find the meaning. And he goes into this diatribe about, you know, we would have to go back and look at the person who taught me how to stand up for a woman on the train. And it goes, and it's deeper than that. And so in essence, it's like, there is no meaning. And I don't think he's saying that to her. I think he's saying that to the audience. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this in this moment, you enter the gates. Yeah. In that yes. scene, I think it's really, really powerful. Oh, that's um, very good. That's very good. Yeah. Keep it. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, and then the final thing is kind of a kick, which I saw this before you started mentioning this, before I started listening to you, is the skit. It's like the SNL skit of the British Nazis. And they're like, well, why are we wearing the skulls? Like, you know, like we're always dressed in black, you know? And so the moment they're in the barn and the, and the lead actor says, well, who did it? Who is responsible? Because essentially what you realize in that moment is it was in fact an accident against all odds. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's in denial and he's demanding who did it, who is responsible. There has to be someone or something. And in that moment, the collective voice is saying, are we the baddies? Yeah. You know, and um, this scene at the very end, um, when the the lead bad guy is sitting there on the ground and he's about to shoot him and he says, what did we ever do to you? Yeah. And that's the last words he ever utters. And so there's just like all these elements of like the rupture oh, yeah. and the gaze and all of that mixed in there with the, with those three things. Uh, yeah. Everything you said is brilliant there, man. And very brief comments on it, on them. Like uh, the first one you mentioned actually really connected with the point I was trying to make with that, the breath and the plane is, he said to his daughter, he was almost kind of trying to rationally talk her out of it. Like, you know, not realize it. So he's, he was almost kind of given a rational, there is no angels, there is no this or whatever, rather than letting her have that crutch for a little while and work through it. And then, as you said, for him, he already knew she was dead, but she, but he, he knew it, but he didn't allow himself to know it. So when he was in the bathroom and he was shouting out, she's dead, she's dead. It was like, again, it's the, it echoes the same thing. Like he thought he was being rational with his daughter and just giving her the facts, the facts that he knew. I know she's dead. I'm telling you that she's dead, but he didn't know. 
he didn't know she was dead. He he hadn't been able to subjectively take that suffering on. And then he says, she's dead, she's dead in the bathroom. And then the gaze thing, that's brilliant. I really, really appreciate that. That, that moment when he says, that guy says to the daughter, there's a centillion thing ways there's contingency and there's a look in his eyes that's the moment and I remember it so clearly it happened again that's the moment when I saw the contingency of the movie that was the moment yes when the gaze hit me and I kind of saw that I was caught up in the same scapegoat mechanism as all the characters I was one of those characters and I had the realization oh crap there is no, there, these writers of justice are not responsible. Uh, Courtney, jump in. Yeah, so for me, that particular moment came right when um, the boy, Bodashka, I think was his name, the, oh, the yeah. Ukrainian boy. Um, no, Je he, Jen, was it Jewel? <laughs> what was the short name they called him? The, the Danish name, Jens Ole or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when he's telling his his little story about the bear and the diamond ring, and you know the whole time he's telling it, I'm thinking, okay, he's going to get to the point and say, oh well, they found the ring in the in the bear, and then he said there was nothing, and that's when it hit me. Oh, I've been doing the same thing that the characters in the movie are doing, wanting to have a meaning, even though you know intellectually I know better. <laughs> yeah. So for me, that that was the moment. But I, I loved that moment because, um, I mean, I've been thinking the, at, before that point, I had already been thinking they're not they're not going to find a meaning. They're not going to find it. Mm -hmm. And um, and then when he told that story and said in the end, there was nothing. And then he just, you know, then he just stops talking. And I thought, oh, there it is, because. You know, sometimes movies do things that they don't know that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't completely sure. Hi, baby. Hi. <laughs> I wasn't completely sure that the that the movie makers, the filmmakers knew that they were doing this. But as soon as he said there was nothing, I thought, oh, they do know what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> I felt more like the characters. The genius of that scene for me was you got it. I didn't. And I was like the character. So whenever he tells the story and all the characters look at him like, what does that mean? Um, that was so clever because for a lot of people watching it, that was that was the giveaway. But but for many people, it wasn't the case. For you, it was, yeah. which is very good. I was I was too dumb. I mean, I'm I'm surprised that because it's my whole thing, but I was too dumb to kind of to see that that was <laughs> that 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 was the moment. I, I needed the point where he was in that guy was in the room with the daughter. So it was very clever that it dropped the answer in. For, for you, it was the, the moment. But the characters, I was still one of the characters. And when they all looked at him, and one of the guys kind of like tells the girl, don't say anything. Like, yeah. like don't, don't ask. I felt you like- don't know what he's saying. Just ignore him. Just ignore him. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> but then the uh, Leonard, the wild haired guy, I oh. love this line. He goes, well, now it's going to be really exciting to see if the water boils. You know, and then I thought, well, who knew that the Danes had such a dry sense of humor? I love it. Yes. Um, another thing I was going to share that um, that I thought close to the beginning of the movie. Um, I I live in Oklahoma. I'm not from here, but I live here. And Oklahoma is kind of it's Midwest, but it's also South. It's it's kind of this weird cultural mishmash of really um, in many points, miserable history. But it's also very much in what we call the Bible Belt. Um, like, it's very rare to just run into somebody who's not in some form or another a Christian. Um, and I grew up in Germany. So um, it's very, it's still very weird to me to, mm. you know, to realize, okay, everybody around here believes in God. That's weird. Um, but one of the phrases that that comes up a lot in in jokes, but not really joking in Oklahoman culture is y'all need Jesus and the pretty early on in the movie especially when you know when when they were the way they were talking to each other and when they were just saying the wrong things you know <laughs> Matilda comes in and says I can't sleep and he's like just go back to bed and count down from 500 
you know, I as a parent am thinking, no, that's the wrong thing to say. Everything <laughs> he says is the wrong thing to say. Everything yeah. they say to each other, it's all the wrong thing to say. And yes. I kept thinking, all y'all need pyrotheology. <laughs> but, say, but they all they all say always said the wrong thing in the right way that was yes it, and in <laughs> yeah. the end it worked out in the end all of them together saying the wrong thing to each other is actually what brought them into this absolutely gorgeous communion with each other yes. you know i i loved the juxtaposition and in those those final scenes where they're all sitting around in their goofy stupid christmas sweaters and um Emmentaler is trying to play the French horn and Leonard gets mad and uh, Otto's, you know, stroking his back, trying to calm him down. And all of this kind of sweetness and light is going on between all of them, in spite of the fact that they're still kind of in tension with each other. And in the background, you still see the bullet holes in the wall. Yeah. It's like yeah. the, the violence and the destruction that they have gone through is still there. It yeah. has not been healed and it probably won't, you know, even if, even if they spackle over the bullet holes and paint the walls and whatnot, it will still have happened, but oh, yeah. That's great. they That's are great. together in communion. They are a found family and no matter what loss or grief is yet to come. Cause like, you know, like, um, I think it was Leonard when he was being the fake psychologist with Matilda he told her <laughs> well all sorts of horrible things are going to still happen to you if you live long enough <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't say that to a grieving teenager but um but he's he's right you know that's mm. just life that is that is living as a human being in this universe and yet they will be together to to deal with it together and I yeah just, and, yeah and that it's I like, don't Utterly beautiful. And it's so opposite of like, um, you know, a Home Alone comes to mind. I don't know how Home Alone ends, but any movie like that might end with a very kind of like family reconciled and everything back in order, everything back in place. But this film really did end with, um, and, you know, the, the idea of communion. I use the you know, term communion almost. It's like there is a there, it's not sickly sweet as you said this beautiful bu yeah. the bullet holes are still there the tension is still there you can tell it's explosive but also they're all held together it's so it's not twee it's not shallow mm -hmm. it feels real yeah that was beautifully that's, done that's, and I, I that's what i did appreciate about them all consistently throughout the entire movie saying the wrong thing mm -hmm. that is very real yeah. um we need my, to be better at that. I need to be better. Like I'm terrified. Are, how many of us are scared of saying the wrong thing? Oh, you know, it's it, awful. You know, it's yeah. awful. Um, yeah. we, my family, we lost both of my in-laws to non-COVID related illnesses in 2021. Uh, my husband's parents within a span of, of seven weeks of each other. And I mean, here's another Oklahoman phrase, bless everybody's hearts. They, everybody says the wrong thing. And, you know, there's no way to tell somebody you just said the wrong thing. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's, um, yeah. That's and that, just, and that's, it's yeah. so human. It's so it human. So and human. that's what, I mean, that's, it's so beautiful you bring that up because I want for us, and it's a very, we're all very remote, but to be, to have, for all of us to feel safe that if we say something that that's like the wrong thing or if, that they'll they'll be grace shown and that we'll do the mm -hmm. same because there is a, i think a real fear of us is sometimes a certain things we're going to say the wrong thing and there was that's beautiful about this movie is like they say the wrong i mean some of the lines are brilliant whenever Mar marcus says to that guy about like yeah you weren't very responsible when it came to your daughter i'm like but but, but me. <laughs> yeah but he'll but he they were able to stand in that tension of, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. The whole thing is just brilliant. I loved it. Uh, the, I, I think the wrong thing sometimes is, you know, like you were saying, the fear of saying the wrong thing, but my fear is that I'm, I'm saying the wrong thing, but it's actually the right thing. So when Leonard tells her, he's like, you're going to have a, a whole lot more bad things happen to you in your life. I mean, yeah. she was okay hearing that. I mean, like, but he also followed that up with, you know, and there's going to be a lot of good things too. But, yeah. um, you know, there could be the wrong thing that's just the wrong, but it's sometimes it's just the fear of saying the wrong thing that doesn't allow you to say the right thing. Very true. And because in psychoanalysis, like the intervention is 
kind of saying something that is disruptive. Like there is a, there's always a courage that sometimes when you say something that, that will cause disruption, but that's sometimes the right thing. To, and yeah, so yeah, very well said. Yeah. Um, Justin, jump in. Oh, and I love the hands up thing. That works very well. So anybody wants to say something, either just jump in or put up the virtual hand. I gotta find that. Sorry. Justin. Yeah. Hey, can can you all hear me? Loud and clear. Perfect. Yeah, I'm on my phone out of town. So first off, for any of you that I don't recognize, usually I'm the one running these these talks. So thanks to Pete for doing one for a month because uh, I've become increasingly busy with my life, and also this weekend didn't work. So I'm glad we were still able to do it, and I'm glad that Pete picked a movie that I had never even heard of, and I don't think I would have stumbled upon. So as a uh, I, I really loved it. I, I messaged Pete that this was a a, a great surprise because I had, I'd never heard of this movie. But I think what and and you know forgive me for when I'm just watching it and not thinking that I'm leading a conversation. My uh, my thoughts might be a little bit half baked here, but I I really liked how they bookended the movie with the the loss of that bike as kind of a a lost object that would kick the plot off. And in, in some ways, when, when the little girl finally like had the epiphany, oh, the bike actually was the originary cause of all of this, she's not 100% wrong, but it's similar to, to Citizen Kane, for example, where at the end they show you the sled and it was like, that was the big secret to his personality and it's intentionally um, doesn't really explain anything. It's just a sled in the same way. It's like, even if she would have figured out who stole this bike and the lost object would be returned and it would the, the answer would be there this was actually the uh the solution to the whole mystery it's so dissatisfying to think that your mom died because some little girl wanted a blue bike instead of a red bike and that kicked it all off that that would offer nothing to you so in some ways the fact that 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 lost object could not be recovered is as as people I think correctly said, is what causes that community at the end to be possible. Um, and and as much as all the characters throughout the plot, you do need to have that transference. You need, you, you need to have the uh, um, that desire. You you need to uh, project that meaning onto something, even if it's a uh, imagining that the Mads Mikkelsen, Mikkelsen character like he's such a an ass kicker, or he'll have the answer, he'll he'll kill the right guy, and then we'll all feel like this is resolved. And then only at the end when it's shown that none of them, they're they're all castrated together. And I think that's really like a, a beautiful thing. And the way to not necessarily resolve the plot, because the the plot resolves by just showing you this little girl on the bike at the end, which doesn't really again resolve anything. But I I do really like that they that they bookended the movie with that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's very good. I mean, because they almost the movie kind of resolves before that scene. You know, they're all together, they're all on Christmas, and you don't expect that last that last scene of the bike. It's a, like a cap that caught me completely off guard, but it did bookend it perfectly. And I love the connection with Citizen Kane. Yeah. Do you have other and, things? Keep keep going. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the only other thing I think I'll say, and I like the people brought up that scene too with the the girl, with the sticky notes on her wall. I I. I really think that was a great line that when I think the girls are like, oh, there is no meaning or there is no reason or whatever. And then he said, oh, no, there's a centillion reasons. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> it's almost like if you're searching. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's like God is God is broken into a centillion little pieces and they're all they're all like, in, in isolation. All these things would be meaningless. And it's it's kind of like within philosophy, if you're all uh, familiar enough to know of God as the uncaused cause, kind of like the first the first cause that kicks off a, a billion chain reactions and that everything that has ever happened is part of this kind of mechanistic flow chart of possibilities. And there's like one thing at the beginning that kicks it all off. And I like that when they talked about, um, and I'm, I'm not a scientist, so I don't really know how to exactly explain this, but when they talked about even like there would be nothing if it weren't for this slight imbalance between protons and neutrons. So even just saying oh, that yeah. uh, if you get down to the very bottom, it's just that there is this little, this sliced imbalance and that's the the cause, which again is is 
unsatisfying and nothing, but it, it still is like, there's no way to put this all back and make everything work perfectly and be balanced as people pointed out with the, the bullet holes and everything is like at, at rock bottom, we're still talking about something that's off kilter a little bit. I think that was really, really good. That's very good. I, um, I didn't pick up on that. I remember that line. Um, but I didn't pick up on a significance because, but that's exactly it. It's beautifully, it's put in there to kind of go, there's a slight asymmetry in the universe. If there wasn't an asymmetry, if there wasn't disruption, there'd be no life. Like that's what it's, so he's, he's teaching her and her homework, this lesson again of the movie. It's so well written. Like it's so well written, but, um, but yeah, a, a perfect little um, signal. Um, and I, yeah, and I love the idea of not a lack of meaning, but the multiplicity of meaning. So it's like, you look at a painting and you don't go, oh, it, it lacks meaning. Go like, no, 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 it's got so many meanings that when you come back to a painting that you love, you'll get something new out of it because not because it lacks meaning, but because it's saturated with meaning. So it's again, this, not this kind of nihilistic, oh, no, life has no meaning, but it's like, it's like, no, 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 there is a, there's a saturation. I mean, but that saturation is precisely what prevents us from, finding the meaning that so we have to kind of like give ourselves over to to the 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 ocean so yeah very good yep well thank you so yeah i'll i'll see the floor to everybody else but just say this was uh it's it's fun to be on the spectator side and uh last night while i was watching the movie in the first 10 minutes or so i was pausing to take notes then i reminded myself i don't I don't have to come up with anything smart for this one, so I can just watch it and enjoy it. That was nice. nice. Well, I didn't expect you to come. That's great that you were able to hey. appear and yeah. be here. Um, oh, I was funny watching it with my friend because I told him it was a comedy, an action comedy, and he thought I was joking because the first 10, 15 minutes is like pretty serious. And so I, and then he went, oh, you weren't joking like it was. <laughs> He's like, yeah, the first 10 minutes is pretty dark, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's there's some moments where I don't know Danish. I've, I don't know any Danish people, but... Uh, there are moments where I, I thought, in some ways, I wonder if, I mean, if you're from, if you're Danish, you must be proud of Kierkegaard. I mean, like, that's like, there, if one of the most famous philosophers of all time came from your little country, you must be very proud of that. And I thought there's a lot of uh, um, humor in this that felt kind of uh, informed by that, that sort of absurdity or that kind of uh, bizarre dryness to it, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a very good point. Like, I... I didn't watch it with Kierkegaard in mind, but actually it, it, at least that spirit's there. And I bet you more than that spirit's there, there's something very Kierkegaardian about, potentially about the movie that I need to rewatch with that question in mind. Um, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think the absurdity, but yeah, I've, so. I'll, I'll turn it off to, or turn it over to anybody else. Oh yeah, so uh, Kyle, do you want to jump in? Sure, thanks. Um, what a brilliant film. Thank you so oh, much. <laughs> I'm so glad you enjoyed it. I mean, some of you may not have, but it sounds like you's, you's liked it as much as I did. So great. <laughs> yeah, a quick disclaimer. Um, I unfortunately only saw it the once when it came out, I guess a couple of years ago. Oh. Um, so I, I don't really have anything to say about uh, the content specifically, but I, I guess I just, um, as I was reflecting on it um, this morning, uh, it, it seemed to me that it 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 could be, and it it, it would have been so easy for this film to um, take the tragic tone, right? The kind of condemnatory tone, especially around the violence. I guess I'm very personally interested in like a theorization of violence. Um, and, you know, I can easily imagine a film, right? That brilliantly kind of explores this notion of, um, the contingency, right? Um, dealing with, um, you know, identifying the fetish object, right? And then the, you know, the the removal of it. I mean, you, you can, I, I can easily affect, you know, imagine a movie that does all of this very well, right? That, that, <clears throat> that demonstrates um, the, yeah, I guess it just this, this contingency. Um, and then after that, you know, kind of, uh, In, in a sense, like after that move, right, kind of falls into uh, a, tra a, a tragic note. These figures are tragic because they don't realize, you know, the contingency at work. Um, 
And so I just love so much that this movie refuses to do that, right? Um, you know, even as um, there is this, you know, gross violence, you know, he's, I mean, <laughs> he's killing people. They're doing, I mean, the whole thing, it's like, I love that. Um, it just, it's like, there's something about the, the comedic um, approach, right? That is so much more subversive. It's like, it, it's the comedic approach that really ultimately takes the sting um, out of the violence. Right, it is the ult. It's the the ultimate subversive kind of uh, approach, um, and uh, it's just so. I, I just feel like that's such a rare thing, and I just wanted to like call that out. That, um, yeah, it's not often. You know, it's, I guess it's it's not often that we get movies that uh, kind of pull back the curtains and and, and uh, along the lines of you know what we've been all been, what we've all been talking about, right? Like. Like there, there, uh, where we where we find um, this source of ultimate meaning, we find an empty space, right? This mm -hmm. this general empty space. Like it's rare enough to get a movie that deals with that theme, but to have one that does that, but then refuses to fall into like uh, a, again a condemnatory kind of tragic. Uh, I mean, it is yeah. it is tragic, right? That's I mean, there's it's tragedy comedy, but. Um, at the end of the day, it just maintains this like razor wire ambivalence, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, start to finish that just really, really blew me away. Um, and so are that, you, are, that's, yeah. Are you yeah. saying, because that's very good, like, are you saying that, like, because I'm thinking of the, the, the tragic figure, you mentioned the tragic figure, and, and, you know, the ironic viewer would be where the film would say, we would know that they're caught up in this futile stupid thing but they don't know but the, one of the things about the film is it doesn't do that is we're caught up in it with them yes and then we yes. realize at the same time as them because that's a really interesting point like we're not watching as ironic viewers going they're dumb they're the tragic figures you're caught up in some fantasy we the viewer are caught up with them is that what you mean is that what you're saying yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. and i just and i never got the sense that the film is um, I mean, even as um, I don't even remember the names of the characters, right? But mm -hmm. but he kills this guy kind of ultimately mistakenly, right? So it's just like, <laughs> but I never got the sense that the film is even condemning him, right? It never it never says, oh, now he's the villain, mm -hmm. right? Now he's the bad guy, right? Um, it just kind of like it feels like it 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 refuses to go all the way there, yeah. right? Which um, again, it's just like this crazy ambivalent kind of space right and i think again that is um where 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 like cinema gets potentially the most subversive right mm -hmm. um it actually does subvert that ambivalence it subverts the violence it subverts the tragedy within the film mm -hmm. um in a in a way that's even more powerful than um yeah, again, yeah, it's it's getting into like the concept of desire and and, and all of that. Um, but yeah, no, I, yeah. I totally agree with with what you're saying. I think it's just a uh, just a different way of of saying that. But thank you. Well, here, yeah. Kristen, do you want to jump in as well? Because I want to get three of them. Oh, you, uh, I have to go. So, um, thank you all. It's been really great, Peter. Thank you for the introduction to this movie. I'm I'm completely taken with it. So. Okay. Here, before you go, then I would, I would actually, this is a really good conversation. I would love to share this. Are, are people happy if I share the audio of this? Does anybody feel weird about that? No, that's good. Cause uh, yeah, thank you. Just wanted to ask you before you left. All right. Have a good night. Bye. You too. Bye. Thank yeah. you, Courtney. Thank you. And we'll go on just for another like 10, 15 minutes. Anybody else who needs to jump out, just jump out. It's being recorded. Kristen, jump in. Yes. I, this is not really a question, but I'm going to put you on the spot a tiny bit because I'm sad that no one's mentioned Rene Girard yet. And I don't know Rene Girard well enough to bring him up in a meaningful way, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I always, I don't know if I, I'm not like, I don't have any relation to him. Unfortunately, I wish I did because then it would like make my name make more sense. Yeah, I just knew, I just realized that I never, I never made that yeah. connection. There's Gerard, isn't it? Your I name know. <laughs> and now see, this is one of the, so I'm, I love, love, love um, 
I've been trying to educate myself about like harm prevention and violence intervention and things like this. And so I was, this is one of the things that fascinated me about the movie is it's such a brilliant question to ask of like when people are in a place of extreme grief or they're on the brink of violence or their life is in turmoil, the, the energy that that creates in someone's body is very real and very tumultuous and chaotic. And when you're on the outside watching someone in a place like that, if you're lucky and you know that person well enough and you have a little bit of, you know, emotional intelligence or insight, hopefully you can help people that are in situations like that. But it's, I think this is, that's like being able to intervene and prevent violence is one of the greatest skills a person can have, like to protect their community and watch out for people and help people make good decisions and help people deal with grief. And so this is one of the things that's on my very long like summer to-do list is like, I want to find out what Rene Girard has to say about this because he spent so much time from his own perspective, looking at what is it that draws people to want to latch onto the sacrificial thing, person, whatever, as a way to dispel some of that energy. Um, but what, I don't know, can you tell me what else Rene Girard says about that? Uh, well, I mean, that's a very productive avenue to go down, definitely. Um, yeah, I, and, and Girard's work absolutely is all about the scapegoat mechanism, all about putting our violence onto the other as a kind of cathartic experience. So I think looking at this film through a Girardian lens would be very interesting. I'm just kind of thinking about, does anybody have any thoughts on that while I'm thinking about a Girardian kind of reading of this film? Uh, I mean, just the fact that this whole community forms around the idea of scapegoating um, the gangster or whatever like the, the, the guy's name is, or the writer justice in general scapegoating that gang as um something i guess would be a direction to go but yes oh that's very true because yeah the, the whole girardian thing of yeah the community gathers around the shared enemy the shared scapegoat i mean there would be a way of doing this movie it would be a different movie but there could be like because one thing it did do for good or for bad is they did make the body um really kind of kind of uh, caricaturely bad, right? So the president of Riders of Justice was a figure that we had no sympathy for. So even though he wasn't guilty, there was no doubt in our minds that this was a very evil, terrible person. It would have been actually quite interesting, but it would have been hard to do and it would be a different movie. But if in a way they'd somehow done it, that the kind of an, uh, the reveal was, this guy, well, might have been a bit bad, might have been a bit of an asshole, might have been whatever, but but was, you know, if he was, if he kind of came up as relatively innocent, that would have even been, a, that would be a more Girardian movie. That would be right, where they, it would they, be everyone doing their best and yet everyone still manages to hurt everyone anyways and yeah. help everyone at the same time. <laughs> well, or, or that, but also the kind of the, the ultimate realization of, the 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 body or the scapegoat is innocent that's like the that's that's the ultimate Girardian inside of the Christology is you know we put all of our violence onto Christ and then we realize Christ is innocent and then we realize yes. oh oh my god he's the carrying our violence now I think the movie does that relatively successfully but it, as I say if it was kind of I if, if Girard was in there more you might have ended up having a character who you were like you're like, oh, not only did he not do it, he's actually not that Riders of Justice weren't that bad. But as I say, that would be that'd be a different movie. <laughs> Isn't it kind of what happens though, Pete, in that I mean, obviously, big picture, there's still a violent gang or whatever, but as far as the cause of all of this, they are completely innocent. They have they had nothing to do with the the train crash. It was entirely a thing that this community projected onto them. So I think it, it yeah. is there. It is I mean, there. You can't, yeah. you can't. It is there. If, if you and found you know, justice were just like a, I don't know, a fantasy football group or something, and it was like had nothing to do with it. Like, of course, that would be a whole different movie. But yeah. No, you're right. It is there. And and I, I think you brought up like that line that the guy says before he's killed is a very 
if you want to read it in terms of Gerard, it kind of, it does emphasize that because he goes like, what are you, why are you doing this? Like, and because in a way you could put yourself into writers of justice's position and go, this guy's just gone and killed the guy's brother. Like he shot him or he broke his neck and he's, and then he, and then he machine gunned a pile of people coming out of a coffee shop. So yeah, no, I just, I, I, I like what you're saying. And I think it is there. So I don't even want to say it as a critique of the film. Um, you know, but th- yeah, so that's well said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, John, Christian, do you want to jump in? Yes, I wanted to say something that, <clears throat> Justin, uh, your original, what you first said um, helped me a lot. It helped me kind of refine um, an idea that I had which I think I had just missed the mark, but it's funny that I also thought of Citizen Kane. And the last scene where it came to mind was whenever um, Emmental, is that his name, Emmentaler? He pulls out the French horn. And I, I think the, the immediate like visual symbolism of the beautiful shiny object coming out, because he has mentioned it earlier at, before he was 17, that he was part of the group. And he, he was, I think he was basically a message of he felt the oceanic oneness whenever he would wear his outfit and he played his French horn proudly and he was, uh, uh, you know, part of something bigger than himself. He felt security and safe. And then when you turn 17, you're no longer allowed to be a part of it and you're out on your own. You're, you know, you're banished to the cold world, uh, the harsh reality of, of life. And so to me, I feel like the French horn was in some way rosebud, like him pulling out uh-huh. the the French horn and it's like, that was Rosebud to Citizen Kane. Like it's not the the French horn itself. It was something it represented. This like return to oceanic oneness and wholeness. And um, and so my dad, I have to steal his thunder here. I'm sorry. He had a really brilliant insight after we watched the film because I mentioned that to him about I thought there was something there with the French horn. And what does Mads say when they're like, just play something already? And then what is it? You had the insight about Mads lying to him. That I thought was really brilliant. Oh, I don't know if it was that brilliant, but he, but, but he, the French horn guy is the technical guy. He's everything can numbers prove everything. It's analytical. But in the very final scene when they're the Christmas, uh, Mads, the, the lead protagonist, he says, just play something random. Uh, so not something uh, meaningful, not something specific to the time, and the, just play something random because he's just gone from a world of where I've my whole meaning has been supported by this idea of this. It's just like, I'll oh, just play something random. <laughs> meaning yes. anything else. Very good. Yeah, that's very good. Very good. I was like, going to say, Justin, I thought that maybe was a better analysis of like that the bite, I didn't consider that in the end. The is, bite's a better, is like better, yeah. that was the object. Yeah. Like that, you know, I, I, think the bike, I think the bike would be the rosebud for me of the entire yeah. plot, similar yeah. to Citizen Kane. But for each of those individual characters, they have their own lost object, whether it's the Otto character, if it's his wife and his daughter, and yeah. then obviously like his his right arm that kind of he carries with him that, that castration. Or if it's the 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 dad and the daughter who obviously lost the wife mother, if it's uh the airman trout, whatever his name is, uh if if uh for him is the French horn or the uniform, whatever you yeah. want to call that performing. Oh, I think yeah. they all they all have this lack. And as I think this is a what we've kind of been been saying, it's it's not that any of them would say, Oh yeah, of course I would rather have this group of these four or five guys that we or whatever, this this community. I would if I could go back and do it, I would sacrifice my wife or I would sacrifice my mother, or I would sacrifice whatever so that I could have this group of friends. They would never say that, but I think that in some ways the point is, you're er, everybody is going to have this this lack, and the only way of communing or like getting that back is to recognize that you share that lack with other people, and I think that is, um, yeah, a, a really beautiful thing. Mm. Yeah, and, in, and the two main characters, um, Mads Mikkelsen, and then the the auto character. I, it's it's very clear that they would never have been able to connect. They're not compatible people in any way until they both recognize that we both lost our wives. And I think that's what they, by the end, become compatible against all odds only by that lack. Hmm. Very good. I'm um I I'm a bit I'm still thinking about 
how you could have written an alternative ending. I'm kind of lost <laughs> in that. I got, I got a, when I was thinking about how, from the position of writers of justice, you can see why they were so pissed off, right? You know, the guy killed his brother. They killed some of their friends. We don't actually know how bad writers of justice is. There are hints, and of course, two of them are put away in prison. So we do know they're bad. But I'm wondering what it would be like. Well, I'm just thinking about it in relation to Pig. I would recommend anybody who hasn't watched Pig, watch Pig, because I say it has a similar structure, but it goes, it has a different type of end. And um, yeah, so I almost like wonder whether you could have had a showdown where both sides, the writers of justice and the the crew that we're for, somehow kind of um, realize that somehow you that they're not guilty i don't know i'm not sure i just watch pig if anyone hasn't watched pig and see how they do the end it's but um that's not a criticism as such because i really like the ending but anyway but if you well, haven't think, shot him oh. well i think an alternative ending is that they all at the very end you see them all in orange jumpsuits because the one plot hole i felt like is how are they all commuting around for christmas they've just murdered dozens of people yes yes <laughs> what what exactly like that was just an interesting plot hole to me. It was like there were a dozen bodies on the guy's front lawn. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, they could maybe they all maybe, end up in an orange yeah. jumpsuit in the alternative ending of my story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay, we'll jump in, uh, Ruth and Chris. Ruth, go for it. Ruth. Uh, yeah. Um, on a YouTube review of the movie, they said that their director is making a U.S. version. So, oh. unfortunately, that may have a different ending. Yes. Well, although that's more likely to have a bloody ending, I'm wanting them to go less bloody, which we definitely is not going to happen. <laughs> Did you just see that? Did you just look that up there now? No, I watched it earlier today. I watched the YouTube um, review yeah. of the movie. And I oh, put the link in the chat. Yeah, she put a link in the chat. And did you say, Ruth, that there it's going to be the same lead, Mads Mikkelsen? Yes. And then the different same. supporting actors? That that's sounds they... fascinating. That's what they said. Of course. Sure, it could there, change. Things, could, you know, who knows? Movies can be made and not sure, reach the sure. market. A lot of things could happen. I don't yeah. know. I don't know what the time frame is, but. Oh, well, thanks for dropping that in. I just made a copy of it because when I close this, it'll all disappear. So I'll watch that. Yeah. Was it a good review? Was it? It was decent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this discussion was deeper. Oh, cool. That's good. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Um, Chris, do you want to jump in? Or Ruth, yeah, are you yeah. finished? To go back to, to uh, I wanted to say something about Emin Teller um, that they were touching on a minute ago, just as quickly as I can. But interesting, great character. And I think um, his frustrations uh, through from the French horn were obvious. Remember, he was kicking the dead body, um, you know, because this was the, the guy represented all the, all the, vitriol that he'd received in his life. He, um, God, what else did he do? Oh, do you remember, it was hilarious when he, he put the gun together, but then they were shooting at the wood pile and he just, he went off. I, yeah. I was dying laughing, but it was his aggression toward that. I mean, it's like, I've got this gun in my hand. I'm finally able to, this violence is actually able to come out. I mean, he had violence towards resolution and computer screens. And also, you know, was, was he the guy kicking? Did he kick the dead body? Yeah, he was, yep, he yep. was kicking the dead yeah. body, cussing at it, you know, and then he was he'd shooting the wood pile, constantly angry with uh, Leonard, and who was always angry with him. Uh, the resolution on the computer screens, nothing could be done right. I mean, it's a constant source of frustration. But then, you know, and through his community and the French horn, was he then allowed in the kind of symbol of love to, to sing, you know? Yeah. To let this, to let his French horn do what he'd been wanting to do, what he had inside him this this whole time. But yeah. through that scapegoat, he was able, he was able to 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 to, to connect with that. I felt yeah. so. Yeah, it that shows how well written this was. Like all the characters are so well written. They're they're consistently, they're logically consistent. They're the within universe. I mean, I, I so frustrated with so much writing in movies because. There's so little consistency or depth or psychological depth. And just what you're talking about there with that character, he's, it's he is so well-rounded. Yeah. yeah. I was almost like 
mad that I hadn't heard of this movie before because it really was much better than I was expecting. And I watched it for the first time, maybe a couple of days after you posted about it. And then I watched it a second time yesterday. And I was still, yeah, I just, I agree. There are so few things that I've watched that are worth watching again, that I was like, oh, finally, something that's like <laughs> worth spending time watching even a second time and still get something out of it is really nice. Yeah, yeah, no, so refreshing, so refreshing. I think the uh, title in English just do, didn't, yeah, doesn't just like Riders and of Justice. I was like, I'm not interested. That yes. And like American movies, they give you like the shittiest trailers of like only the scenes where someone gets punched in the face, right? And then there's like one catchy one liner, and I'm like, that's that's a poor representation of what this movie is about. So. But can I can I give a defense of that? But here's my because yeah. you're absolutely right in terms of most movies. My defense to see if this works. Um, it's with Riders of Justice, the title and the trailer. I haven't actually seen the trailer, but I can guess you're exactly right about the trailer. They gives you the sense, of, and especially Mads Mikkelsen, he's got a gun, and it's, it just gives you the sense that you're going to get a standard Hollywood movie. So they're like uh, setting you up for it. That's what I think. I okay. think they're setting you up for it. Okay. Yeah, and and they. they may, they may be doing it for two reasons. One might be to get more people to watch it, right? Absolutely sure. cynical. Sure. But but also, I think it it gives it even more impact because. Yeah. And so they did this with Pig, and Pig did it very well because I was totally didn't know what I was getting with Pig, or actually with Riders of Justice. Because honestly, it, it sounds like a Jean Claude Van Damme old eighties movie. You know, that's what yeah. it sounds like. It sounds yeah, like it Steven Seagal Riders of Justice. Like I'm going to get a Steven Seagal <laughs> movie. Um, Pig did the same thing. You got. You got Jack Nichols, or sorry, uh, Nick, uh, Nicholas Cage, often an action guy. They really set it up that this is a revenge film. He's going to get revenge, and I think that they did that perfectly because it's it's almost like Fight Club did the same thing. Fight, remember Fight Club and the yeah. trailer for Fight Club? I thought I was just going to watch a fight movie, and then and yeah. then it turned up. So anyway, that's what that was my thoughts on the name because yeah, the name is no, cheesy. That's fair. Because to be honest, you can't put a movie into a trailer. And if you did, your movie would like by definition be horrible. Yes, right. And, and if they gave it away, like a lot of movies. That are, yeah, like a lot of <laughs> movies that are not great. They tell you the whole thing in the trailer. Yes. The whole power of this is you don't know what's going to happen. So it yeah. almost like they have to they have to make you feel like it's a revenge. Because if they said in the trailer that they gave if they gave it away in the trailer. True. Yeah, yeah. It's true. No, you're right. Okay. You changed uh, my mind. I take it back. The trailer's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> it's, the name still made me not watch it though. <laughs> oh yes, it made you not watch it. And Ruth would probably right. be the same because Ruth, you said you, you know you do not like violent movies. And so right. if you saw that trailer and that movie poster, you'd never I wouldn't choose it. it. No, no. Yes, yeah. It was only that you recommended it. Yeah, well, I'm yeah, sorry. This is, why we, this is why we need people like you, Peter, to like tell us which movies are good and worth watching. Oh, and yeah. then we can get together and watch the good ones. <laughs> I do feel that bad because I'm quite desensitized to violence. So Ruth, I understand. I got a friend uh, who she's similar and like watching people get killed in a bloody way on screen. It's just too much. And I'm like, I don't even think I because I'm so desensitized. I'm like, oh, it's fine. But as soon as you said that, I'm like, oh, it is quite violent, actually. It really is, you know. I, I grew up watching cowboys and Indians movies on the, on TV, yeah. you know, and it was, they were also a lot of people were killed. <laughs> so yes. that was, that was what we, you know, it was what kids watch, but it, it's um presented differently now. Yes. Yeah. yes. And Ruth, I always remind myself when you watch old movies where there's violence, half of the time, those actors actually got injured. Whereas, Luckily, today, there's much more better <laughs> protections in place for the people making the film. So chances are no one was injured in the creation of this film. Everyone is OK. <laughs> Although they make you make you feel it like the old movies. You don't see the blood and guts like these modern. That's movies, right. They make you feel. Yeah, true. yeah, that's true. Which which and there's a plus and negative to that, because in this movie, it does make you feel the violence like you are shocked by it, even if you're desensitized like me, like the mm -hmm. violence is violent. Um, it's not like a Rambo movie where a hundred people die and you don't think they're human. There's a there's and a that's a huge compliment to the filmmakers because I'm not. I mean, I don't know that much about what goes into the production of making a film, but I only know enough people living close enough to LA that 
can remind me and tell me like how careful you have to be when it comes to decisions of editing and how many milliseconds after the impact you let the shot linger and what color the blood is and how much of it you see on the screen and what percentage of the screen it fills up like all these tiny decisions make a huge difference on how it feels when you see it in the moment right and so think of like all the people that had to sit in a writer's room and talk about how's how does this scene impact you And is it the right amount of impact or is it too much? Or do we need to hit them harder? And do we need to show the same scenario three or four or five times before you can see the theme unraveling and before people really get it? Like those are the things I think that make this film really good is that you can find the themes quickly and then they really do a great job of developing them and casting characters in new lights throughout the whole story. Like it's really, really well done. Yes, it's incredibly well put together. No, you're right at every level. Again, without putting too much praise on it, you're hitting that. Like I feel like every part of this was thought through. Even who was it? Was it Justin or someone who mentioned that even whenever he he was helping the girl with the homework and said about the, the protons and neutrons, everything just very subtly is yeah. moving in the same direction. Mm-hmm. Um, here, aware of the time, any last comments? We'll just, we'll finish up, but far, far right. ahead, any last comments? I want to jump in quick, just yeah. wrapping it up and uh, inviting everybody else to come out for future future months, because I'd love to see some of the people who haven't been out before for one of these. Um, and Pete, serendipitous, you brought up Fight Club, because whether it's next month or not, I do want to do that soon. So I, I was glad we didn't get into a tangent and uh, <laughs> steal all my material because uh, we'll, we'll see how much I actually have to say, but I would love to have you back out for that one too. Oh, I'll be there. for If you're talking yeah. Fight Club, I'll be there. That's that movie rocked my world. So yeah, I'll look good to forward know, to good that. To know. Okay, guys. Well, listen, thanks so much. That was really fun. I, I really, Justin, I really enjoy Exposure, man. I love that you're doing this and um, makes me appreciate these films all the more. So. Um, I'm very, very happy that conversation. That's why I would like to share it. So thank you, everybody. Um, have a good night. There's a thing in, in Belfast tonight called Hit the North. It's a festival where graphic artists, graffiti artists from all over Europe come to Belfast and paint murals and paint graffiti art. And um, they're across the road from me uh, doing graffiti art and having a drink. There's a guy called Ed Hicks. You can look him up on Instagram. He's a really nice guy. He's into what we're doing here. So going to go over and uh, and see him. So have a great night, whatever you're doing. And I'll um, I'll see you soon. Yeah, Thanks, Pete. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you guys. See you later.